This episode of Harvey Brownstone Interviews is brought to you by the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend Coffee, available at hollywoodblends.com. Everyone's saying it's the best coffee they've ever tasted. Why not give it a try and see for yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is a highly acclaimed, multi-award winning actor, composer, and director whose illustrious career and body of work have made him a respected and beloved icon. He made his Broadway debut starring in Pippin, for which he won a Theatre World Award, followed by Children of a Lesser God, for which he won a whole slew of awards, including a Tony and a Drama Desk Award. He also starred in the Kane Mutiny Court Martial, for which he received a Drama Desk Award nomination, M. Butterfly, Love Letters, Ragtime, and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Off-Broadway, he starred in Rosencrantz and Guildenstern Are Dead, and Counselor at Law, for which he received the Lucille Lortel Award for Best Lead Actor in a Play, as well as nominations for both the Outer Critics and Drama League Awards. He's appeared in over 200 movies, TV shows, made-for-TV movies, and miniseries. Some of his most popular feature films are Getting Straight, The Boys from Brazil, Someone to Watch Over Me, Another Stakeout, 21 Grams, The Candlelight Murders, and Being the Ricardos. On TV, you've seen him in dozens of TV shows, including Family, for which he received an Emmy Award nomination, Crazy Like a Fox, Bureau of Alien Detectors, Star Trek Enterprise, The Young and the Restless, Desperate Housewives, Dear White People, Claws, and many more. His TV movies include The American Clock, for which he received a Cable Ace Award nomination for Best Supporting Actor, Mad, Mothers Against Drunk Drivers, The Gift of the Magi, Norma Jean and Marilyn, and Liberace. And some of his noteworthy miniseries are The French Atlantic Affair, Roots, The Next Generations, The Two Mrs. Grenvilles, When We Rise, Feud, and Headless, A Sleepy Hollow Story. He's directed many stage productions, including Les Liaisons Dangereuses, Macbeth, Wait Until Dark, Brigadoon, Guys and Dolls, and many other shows. Our guest is also a brilliant composer, which comes as no surprise, given that he's the son of the greatest pianist of all time, in my opinion, Arthur Rubinstein. And he's the grandson of the renowned Polish violinist, conductor, and composer Emil Milinarski. He's written the music scores for a number of movies and TV shows, including Jeremiah Johnson, The Candidate, Family, The Ordeal of Patty Hearst, Johnny Belinda, China Beach, and A Walton Wedding. And believe me, I'm just scratching the surface of this man's prodigious body of work. I'm delighted and deeply honored to welcome the incomparable John Rubenstein to our show. Mr. Rubenstein, thank you so much for being here. Gosh, I, I almost uh, fainted listening to all those titles. <laughs> Well, you did all that and and more. You studied theater and music at UCLA and music composition at Juilliard. At that time, were you planning a career mostly in music rather than acting? No, I was always uh, planning a career in acting. I, I, I went to a school in New York City called St. Bernard's, uh, which went up to the eighth grade and was a British school. That And, and the Brits take their public speaking and they're performing and they're singing very seriously, way more than American schools do. And so uh, all of us in, as very little boys, we were, we were taught to sing in harmony. We had to learn these long poems and recite them to the entire school. So we had a sort of a stagecraft and then we performed Shakespeare plays among others. And uh, the eighth grade put on a full-fledged, uncut Shakespeare play. You studied it in the seventh grade. You were assigned your role. You learned it over the summer. You came back as an eighth grader, and you did your play. So I was in a bunch of Shakespeare plays. But by the time I was 12, I knew I wanted to be an actor. Also, I lived in New York. So I went to the theater all the time. My parents loved the theater. So we went as a family. But then when I got a little bit older... Any birthday or Christmas or anything like that, people would just give me a single ticket to the theater. And so I saw everything during a period that a lot of people argue was Broadway's golden age. There's several of them. But the 1950s, 1960s were a, a tremendous time in New York for theater. So I educated 
mostly by going to the theater. Then when I went to college, I came out here to UCLA and did a million plays. You were 35 years old when we lost your beloved father, the magnificent pianist Arthur Rubinstein. So he lived long enough to see you achieve great success as an actor. Did he ever give you any career advice? No. Never? No. He he was very supportive. He he was very excited when I started writing uh, movie scores because I had never studied really composition or anything else. When I played him my first orchestrated, big orchestra, 80 pieces, symphonic sounding movie score, he was very excited and impressed. And he said, how the hell did you do that? <laughs> Well, while we're talking about your father, Mr. Rubenstein, I want to mention that he lost all of his family in Poland during the Holocaust. And over the years, you've done your part for Holocaust awareness and education. In 1978, you were in the classic film, The Boys from Brazil, about a Nazi hunter in Paraguay who discovers a plot to rekindle the Third Reich. In 1981, you were in a TV movie called Skokie about the famous court case against the neo-Nazis who were marching in a predominantly Jewish neighborhood. In 1989, you directed an Emmy award-winning TV special called A Matter of Conscience, which was- Boy, about, you really are on it. Yeah, that was about a teenage boy who finds out that his grandfather was a Nazi. I would imagine that those projects were particularly meaningful experiences for you. Well, yes, they were, uh, mostly because all three of them were beautifully written and put together. I myself am not Jewish, despite my last name. And my father, of course, was and is buried in Jerusalem. And uh, so uh, religion was never a very important part of our family. But the Holocaust obviously uh, uh, wiped out his family. When we went to Poland in 1958, I think I was 11. That was his first return to Poland after the war. And so he was hailed as a sort of hero when he came. It was He was like a rock star, classical pianist, but the airport was just full of people and press, and it was sort of scary and impressive. And all these people that I didn't know came up to me. I'm your great aunt, and I'm your third cousin twice removed, and blah, 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 all these people. And I was, oh, my gosh, it's so nice to meet you. But about the 40th person who did that, I... I realized they were all my mother's family. My mother was Catholic, and uh, her father, of course, her uh, they, they were all Catholics. I went to my father right then in the middle of all that, that hubbub, and I said, hey, wh why is everybody uh, our mother's family? Where, where are your people? And he didn't even talk because there were too many people, but he just gave me a look like, mm hmm you know, like, really? And I said, oh, I get it. And, you know, I was pretty young, but that was when I, I realized I didn't have half of my ancestral family anymore. So that that was a, a very meaningful to me, that event was. And then, of course, uh, I studied in, in school about, about the real Holocaust and was lucky enough to get into those, those pictures and, and TV shows that, that you mentioned. And they were very meaningful to me. The the matter of conscience that thing I directed was was extraordinarily moving, and won won the Emmy as the best best children's special of that year. And it was it was pretty amazing. Yeah, it was Tom a magnificent Aldrich. piece. Aldrich. A magnificent Aldrich. piece. How did it feel to play President Eisenhower on stage, knowing that he was largely responsible for engineering the defeat of Hitler? Well. I mean, uh, I, I I'm playing him tonight, and I played him twice yesterday. Uh, I'm doing that play. It's a one man play. I play Eisenhower after his presidency, and um, yes, arguably the the most deep and and stark moment of the play I'm doing is his description of liberating the concentration camps, and he forced the local population to go through them so that nobody could ever say they didn't know about it. And he made the army film all of the camp as he found it. Um, and those archival films by the army still exist and are what opened the eyes of the world 
up to what had really been going on. People, there was a lot of talk about, well, there are concentration camps and there's this and there's that, but nobody knew what was really taking place in, in those camps. And and Eisenhower uh, was the one who basically not only liberated Europe from Hitler, but showed the world what he had done. So it's it's very, it's very, uh, it's very emotional. And, and I feel, I, dare I say, important for people to keep talking about it. When you were a child, you actually met President Eisenhower, correct? <laughs> yes, I did. My father was playing a concert in Washington, D.C., as he did every year. And he took me and my sister, Alina, who was a couple of years older than me, and, and our mother. And the four of us were there. And Sherman Adams, who was uh, Eisenhower's chief of staff, uh, was a friend of a friend and invited us all to the White House and took us on a sort of private little tour of the White House, which was fascinating. And at one point, he passed a a, a large room. I can't remember what room it was. And Eisenhower was there talking to a group of people. Again, I don't know who they were. And Sherman Adams from the doorway sort of beckoned to Eisenhower, come here. And he said, excuse me, to the people he was talking to. And he came in through the crowd to the door, talked to my parents for a bit. And then, of course, shook my hand. Hi, little fella. How are you? You know, that was that was the extent of my interview with Eisenhower. Look at the karma that you ended up playing him on stage. Now, before we move on from your dad, I have to mention that in 1987, you hosted an episode of American Masters called Rubenstein Remembered to commemorate your father's 100th anniversary. I would imagine that stands out as a very special highlight in your career. Sure, it does. I mean, uh, getting to do something professional that that had to do with my father was, you know, uh, it was very uh, unique and and. It, it gave me an opportunity to, to, I don't know what word to use, to sort of thank him for everything that he gave and showed me in my, in those same 35 years that he was alive. Now, of course, I have to ask you, I'm going from one musical legend to another. You worked with Elvis in The Trouble with Girls. Do you have any memories of Elvis that you can share with us? Well, sure. I worked with him for what three months there uh, on on the big MGM back lot. I was one of four guys who were roustabouts. It was a it was a thing that took place in the nineteen twenties. He didn't do a lot of period movies, you know. That he mostly did contemporary stuff. But here he played the manager of a what was called a Chautauqua. And that was the actually the name of the film before they changed it to The Trouble with Girls. <laughs> and the Chautauqua was a traveling circus carnival, not circus, carnival uh, that had rides and different things, but mostly had a big, big tent where there were musicians and there were acrobats and there were all kinds of acts. Yeah, and so there were many actors in that uh, movie that that played all these all these personalities. And I was one of four young guys. Uh, we had our college letter on our uh, on our sweaters. I was Princeton. And that was my name, Princeton, Yale, Rutgers, and who was the third one? Amherst. And uh, and we were in a lot of the scenes. Sometimes just in the background, carrying stuff and running through. But then at one point, we sang barbershop quartet, uh, although it was a quintet, with Elvis on the stage. And that was that was. Uh, that was really fun. And then, you know, we played touch football during the breaks when when they were lighting the set. Uh, uh, and he was he was a very friendly, very outgoing, good guy. He complained that his fame forbade him to go anywhere. He, we talked baseball. He couldn't go to a baseball game. He couldn't go to a restaurant. He couldn't walk down the street. And even though, of course, as anybody is, you're happy that you're successful and making a lot of money and everybody loves you. He said it's really been a burden for him to just always be surrounded by his guys, who are his great friends, but have to hide from from people because it was a mob scene wherever he went. And so 
that was sort of uh, whimsical and melancholy. And you, you wanted to feel sorry for him a little bit. Did you ever worry about that happening to you? Nope. Good, good. <laughs> I'm a journeyman. I'm an actor. You read my resume there. I mean, I've been working since I was 18. So it's it, next year will be 60 years that I've been a professional actor and musician also along the way and director and all those other things. But I've I've had the sort of career that that I argue is one of the best kinds where, I mean, I've always been a little bit insecure. I, I do live job to job. I'm, I'm, I always need a job. I don't have a big bank account and I'm not a big star. I don't get a pile of scripts offered to me every week. So I, I jockey for each job I get and I do little ones and I do big ones and I'm, but I'm, I'm the guy who's sort of always there. And I've been lucky enough to make a career all these years and, and just get over the finish line to pay the bills sometimes. But wow. I don't ever have to worry about walking around in public because um, people sometimes say, hey, you, did we go to high school together? I said, well, I don't think so. Are you on TV? I said, yeah. Oh, okay. Anyway, people do recognize me, but sort of they don't always know from where. That's That's kind of a blessing. Yes, yeah. it is. That's what I'm saying. You you became a Broadway superstar in 1972 when you played the lead in Pippin, directed and choreographed by the legendary Bob Fosse. I've heard you say in interviews, Mr. Rubenstein, that initially Bob Fosse was not a big fan of the script, but he saw the potential in it, and he told you that the two of you were going to have to save that show. What That's was correct. his strategy to save the show, as he put it? Well, he had a magic touch. You know, he was... <laughs> he had a sort of like intuitive connection with the audience, not not the particular audience in the room that night, but audience in general. He saw the potential in that piece, otherwise he wouldn't have taken it on. Music was fun and, and energetic. Stephen Schwartz's second show, he had written Godspell already. And so he brought arguably some of the best dancers in New York City together to be in the ensemble. And he gave each one of them sort of a freedom to create a character. And then he choreographed these amazing dances. The The leading player, who is the, the sort of devil control character in that piece, was written sort of on the lines of the, the old player in Hamlet, who, who brings the troop of players into the king and he sort of he was sort of an old uh, sort of somebody my age you know with a big beard and said oh my boy yeah, the, uh. and Fosse said nah let's make him you know uh, an african-american let's make him a black dancer singer entertainers got ben vereen to play that part so that things like that and then he assembled this amazing team of of designers Tony Walton and Patricia Ziprot sets and costumes. Uh, so the thing was pretty magnificent and it had a lot to do with Bob Fosse's brilliance and creativity. As you know, Sam Rockwell played Bob Fosse in the TV miniseries about Fosse and Gwen Verdon. In your opinion, how accurate was his portrayal? Well, I love Sam Rockwell. I did a movie with him when he, I think he had probably done a thing here or a thing there, but he hadn't had a career yet. And I said to him then, you're amazing. You're going to have a big career because he, even way back then, was an actor who was just startlingly alive on camera and uh, spontaneous and wonderful. The Fosse uh, a TV show, I, I have to say, I, I didn't go along with very much. Uh, it was full of falsehoods, as, as docudramas are, I mean, about real people. But Bob Fosse was uh, a guy full of sort of electricity, and he was charming, and he was funny, and he loved people, and he loved to talk, and he loved being around people and, and doing what he did. 
and and he gave off this kind of friendliness and attractiveness. This is why so many women went crazy for him because he was sort of irresistible. And the way they wrote it, I don't blame Sam Rockwell for this because I thought he did a wonderful job. But he played what they had written, which was a dour, dark, brooding, sort of uh, suspicious. Yeah, and I'm sure Bob had his definitely his his dark side, as as maybe you do. I certainly do. But that's not who he was. That's not what he gave to his to his fellow workers, to his casts, and to to the people he worked with. He was full of life and full of humor and sarcasm, but it was funny. And he was very, very smart. He got right to the, and the TV movie portrayed him as, well, I don't know what to do. And he would call up Gwen and Gwen would come and, and fix the number and save him. Well, she worked with him a lot, not on Pippin. That was another lie. They made her be around during Pippin. She wasn't. She never was. And they had her come into a rehearsal. He's rehearsing with three dancers. She comes into the rehearsal, which she would never do, sits on the floor. He sits next to her. The girls are still dancing in the background. And she talks to him about the Chicago. She wants to do the next show. And he says, well, blah, blah. and they have this conversation. Those, those kind of things made me a little crazy. But mostly it was the portrayal of Bob as this, as this, mean sort of dark manipulative man anyway that's well I'm, I'm glad to hear that reaction. because those of us who didn't have the honor or the pleasure to ever meet him relied on the miniseries so i'm glad of you course about that now when you were 19 years old you auditioned to replace joel gray on broadway in cabaret but how prince said that although you were clearly the best person for the role you were too young, but he didn't see you in full makeup and costume as the MC. Do you think he may have been wrong to think that you were too young? Oh, I can't say Hal Prince was wrong. No, he he knew what he was doing. But I uh, who I taught an audition class at at USC for many years, and I always told that story to my class, saying, you know, he I did my first audition just straight. And then he said, put on the makeup and come back tomorrow. And, you know, so I did. I went to a makeup place and I put that white face, you know, that, that Joel Gray wore. And he had that little tiny lipstick in the middle of his mouth and he had weird eyebrows. And so I, and I think he had big eyelash things. So he looked sort of clown-like and a little scary. I did do that. But I still had my normal clothes on and I was very skinny and and sort of gawky. And I, I looked younger than 19. I looked like I was 15. And if I always had fantasized that if I had rented a little black, you know, tails, tuxedo thing with shoulder pads and sort of hid my skinniness, and put baggy pants on so that I didn't look so young, I might have had a better shot. But I, I'll never know if that's true or not. Well, I read that you created the role of Molina in Kiss of the Spider Woman. Would you like to have played that role on Broadway? Sure. Sure. That was a weird, that was a weird uh, situation where a bunch of producers got together and created a thing called New Musicals. And the point of it was to save money and to be able to bring slightly more developed shows to Broadway. Uh, Michael Bennett had started, I don't know if he was the very first one, so correct me if I'm wrong, but he started this thing with Chorus Line where he got people together and he did a workshop and they all worked on it uh, in a sort of studio in a rehearsal room. And that became the the way that a lot of broadway shows musicals especially started you would do a, a, a workshop you'd learn your lines but you wouldn't have any costume there wouldn't be any orchestra there'd be a pianist and you would put it on for backers potential backers and other people in in a big rehearsal room and do the whole show that way and from that they would judge it and say uh, what it needed what it needed to be done and also would it be put forward onto Broadway or wherever 
but it was still you were seeing just a rehearsal. You were seeing people in in street clothes and hearing a piano, and it, it just it didn't. So the new musicals people decided let's fully mount a full Broadway looking show up at SUNY Purchase, you know, the State University of New York, just a little north of Manhattan, uh, which had a big Broadway sized stage. Let's get the costumes, the sets, everybody takes a cut, all the unions, the actors, the musicians, but let's have the full orchestra, the full sets, everything as though, but it would cost way, 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 way less and way less than taking it to New Haven or Boston or Washington or wherever for an out of town tryout where you can't cut the unions. The cuts also were that everybody lived in New York. So you could take a train or drive up to SUNY and you lived at home. So nobody had to get you into hotels and there was no travel expense and all that. So the point was that none of the critics would come because it was still in in preparation. It wasn't a finished piece, even though they did sell tickets. So all of the television and radio and print press, there was no internet at that time, agreed, we won't review it. And if it comes to Broadway, we will. If it doesn't, we won't. Except for Frank Rich in the New York Times. He said, nope. I'm the New York Times and Purchase is in, you know, the general New York area. And I, I cover the theater. And if there's an original musical by Kander and Ebb and, uh, you know, directed by Harold Prince, by gosh, I'm going to review it. You can't stop me. And a whole slew of Broadway people, including people that had nothing to do with it. Stephen Sondheim, I remember, was among them, went to the New York Times and Hal Prince, of course, and all those guys. And begged them, please don't do it. We're trying, we're not trying to pull a fast one on anybody. We're trying to put a show together and see what it looks like before we go to the next step. And the Times backed up Frank Rich and he said, Nope, if you put it on and you sell a ticket, I'm there. And he hated it. He saw it. He put it down. He put me down. And and that was the end of new musicals. He he destroyed the whole thing single-handed. Terrible. Yeah. Terrible. I moved uh, back to Los Angeles after that. <laughs> well, that was perhaps a blessing too. You know? Well, I mean, you know, life goes on. Yeah. You know, when I was a kid, I was absolutely addicted to the TV show Dragnet. And you actually got to appear in the 1967 reboot of that show, in an That's episode true. called The Grenade, what was it like to work with Jack Webb and Harry Morgan? Oh, it was it was it was a horrendous experience, even though I was very excited to be there. Because Jack Webb directed the episode. I guess he directed most of them. And he did it in a particular way. When you shoot a scene, you usually, you know, there's a usually a master shot where you see the we had three people him, Harry Morgan, and me in my house. My I was a kid in school and I was I was trying to cover for a friend of mine who was doing drugs and 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 I was sort of lying and making up a story to 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 protect him. That was the scene. And I was standing here and they were standing opposite me looking at me, two of them. Jack was tall and Harry was shorter. And so instead of them being there, which is what you would usually do when it, when it was my close up, so there's nobody on camera but me, and I'm looking there. And in when you shoot a film, what happens is the two people that you're talking to stand next to the camera and talk to you and you play your scene, right? And And when the camera's on them, I stand next to the camera and I do my dialogue with them. Well, they shot them standing there, and, and I was off camera. They did that. They got their shots. Then Jack sat right here, just out of the frame of my close-up, but his head was right here, next to me, looking that way. And Harry Morgan was reading a variety about 30 yards away down the studio. And they put, for me to look at, a taller and a shorter 
prompt thing, a little screen, not not a video screen because they they didn't have those then, but it was a a thing that a guy would mechanically scroll that had the lines of dialogue going by. So there was one that was Jack Webb's character, and there was one that was Harry Morgan's character, and I looked at them, and there were my lines and their lines. And I talked to them as though they were there. Okay, that was fine. So here's Jack sitting right next to me, touching me, actually. And I'm looking at him as a prompter over there. And I'm making up, I'm lying. I'm lying in the in the script. So I'm going, well, uh, I didn't know. He goes, don't say, ah. I said, okay. Well, well, I didn't know that, that he would, don't say that, that, don't stutter. All right, okay. Uh, well, I didn't know that he would, and, and then finally he said, don't give me any of that UCLA method bull. Just read the lines. Just read them quick. So I said, well, I hope that you didn't want to do that, and I'm sorry, but you know, thank you very much. All right, print it. And so that was scary. I didn't enjoy that. I but it worked see. fine. That's I how we did it. certainly understand why. Wow. I had heard that he was a bit of a control freak, but you've just confirmed it. And, you know, I, another one of my favorite TV shows was the Mary Tyler Moore show. And you appeared in an episode in season two called You Certainly Are a Big Boy. What was it like working with that amazing cast? Oh, that was great fun. That was great fun. Everybody laughed all the time. Ted Knight and Ed Asner and and Betty White. It, it, we we had a, a blast. And, and I was just on that one episode. But they they were all so sweet and welcoming and they made everybody feel like you were just part of the family. We had a great time. I, I loved doing that. And also it was live, as so many of those shows are. You rehearse for five days or four. And then on the fifth day, you have a live audience and you're performing. So it's like doing a play. And so there's that added adrenaline and that that's great fun. Yeah, that, that was really fun. Back in the 70s, you had a recurring role in a TV show called Family, which is very significant in television history. A lot of people don't know this because it was the very first primetime show that had a continuing plot line. You were on that show for five years. Did you enjoy that experience of getting to develop your character over a long period of time? Oh, very, very much. That was a it was sort of a groundbreaking show. It, it was it was written really beautifully. Mike Nichols and uh, and Mark Rydell started it out, and and uh, Jay Preston Allen was the writer, and then Nigel and Carol McKeon were the producer writers of it through the first four years. And it was uh, it had wonderful actors, Seda Thompson and James Broderick and uh, Christy McNichol and Gary Frank. And it even Henry Fonda did a guest shot on it one time. And it dealt with with real things. It introduced a gay character when you just didn't and couldn't do that on network television. And all kinds of, of deep and real things that that people deal with rather than being a sitcom. It was it was a, an examination of a very good functioning family but one that that went through the same difficulties that everybody does i had a weird thing where i was one of the regulars but for a whole bunch of reasons i left the show after the first season i i chose to and so they made me and the the woman playing the oldest daughter who i was the the son-in-law i was her husband they uh, made us divorce and there hadn't been a divorce on a, a, a network television show. I mean, there had been divorced characters so that, oh, yes, he she used to be married, but now she's single. And so that was like, you know, uh, very common. But to have two of the regular people who were introduced as part of the family go through a divorce on screen was was sort of uh, groundbreaking, as I said before. And. That then turned into this thing where for the next five years, I kept coming back and we had a child. And so we were in having custody. And then I had a new girlfriend and the, the you know Nancy character got very angry about that. Didn't want the new girlfriend to meet the our child. And then suddenly we were back together and she got pregnant. 
And then she wanted to have an abortion, but I wanted to have the child. So we we had a lot of very, very dramatic stuff to play over the over those five years. And it was it was great. I mean, people people loved the show. Yeah, I loved it. I thought it was really terrific to see dysfunctionality that was reflective of what many people we knew were living through. Mm-hmm. Now, one of my favorite directors who's ever appeared on our show is Randall Kleiser, who directed you in a movie called All Together Now. It's based on a true story about four orphan children who are given 30 days to prove that they can remain together as a family without adult supervision. What was right. Randall like to work with? Oh, terrific. He he was uh, just a ball of energy and creativity and, and just a charming guy. Uh, yeah, we had a we had a good time on that. Yeah, I he asked me to write the music for that too, which was very nice. Well, you've worked with some great directors over the years, not only Bob Fosse and Randall Kleiser, but Sidney Lumet, Steven Spielberg, Mark Daniels, Ridley Scott, Ryan Murphy, Aaron Sorkin, so many others. Do you have a favorite director? Oh no, that all those directors, uh, you know. You, you love them because they gave you the job. So they're immediately very, very high on, on your list. No, they were all extremely different people and, and had wonderful approaches. Sidney Lumet did a thing. We did, we did a movie together. And it was a very complicated movie that went over years. And there were many, many, many actors and characters in it. And he had us rehearse it in a rehearsal studio in New York for two weeks, each scene with the cinematographer, and they would put tape on the floor so you know exactly where the chair is and where the table is, that we we rehearsed scenes driving in the car, just sitting next to each other, people in the back. And he planned all of his shots and we learned all of our lines. And then at the end of those two weeks, for two days, we did, we performed the movie from the first scene to the last scene as a group in this giant room going from place to place, set to set where the, where the furniture and the stuff was laid out and, and performed it and did the whole movie. And then two months later, let's say where one scene was being shot, I would show up and uh, I remember it was a Howard Johnson's I shot and I had already rehearsed the scene. Now I was in a real Howard Johnson's and we were all there, but, but I knew two months in advance exactly what I was going to do in that scene, where I would sit, where I would stand, who else would be where and what we would do. And that was that was unique. And I'd never I've never done that since. And I'd never done that before. Yeah, that's an amazing process. You know, when I was doing my research, I saw that in 1978, you made a Christmas movie called The Gift of the Magi based on the O. Henry story, starring Debbie Boone, who appeared on our show last year. Would you believe that that story has been made into a movie 17 times? Well, yeah, it's a great old story. You know, it's a very, very Christmassy, sentimental love story and very poignant at the end. It has has its own punchline. And that, I think, is what has made it be so eternal. But yeah, no, I'm not surprised about that because it's it's fun to be creative with it. You can change it, keep the story exactly as it is, but change all the surrounding stuff. And yeah, it, it's a it's a beautiful story. But your version is the only musical. Your version right. has Peter Graves and Jim Backus and Joanne Worley, not to mention Debbie Boone and yourself. So I think it's the best. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> we, I think we fantasized when we were making it that it would be like the Charlie Brown, you know, that it would be on every set every Christmas, but it hasn't been. <laughs> you know, one of the really interesting things about your career is that you've played a number of real people. In 1979, you played Jesus in a very successful but highly controversial movie called In Search of Historic Jesus. Yep. You played... Daryl Zanuck in Norma Jean and Marilyn. You played Irving Thalberg in The Silent Lovers. You played George Cukor in Feud. You played Jess Oppenheimer in Being the Ricardos. And of course, you've played President Eisenhower on stage. How do you prepare for a role when you're portraying a real person? I, I If there is anything to see of them, a lot of those that you mentioned, of course, I, you know, were in the days before you could 
go onto YouTube and immediately see people uh, in all kinds of different forms, you know. So the Einstein one was actually uh, interesting because there are recordings of him speaking English. And he had a very, very heavy German Jewish accent like this. Very, very, he rolled his R's all the time. It was almost like a parody. What you like, if you did that, a director would say, uh, take that down a little bit. You're sort of, you're, you look like you're making fun of him. So uh, that was difficult. I had to come back from it a little bit, but a real version of his speech would have been, would have sounded exaggerated. But for Irving Thalberg and, and Zanuck, I didn't really do any, uh, I read somewhere that Thalberg talked very quietly and that this is, he always was very, very understated. And so when I did him, I, I talked like this, but I don't know if I really sounded or, or, or you know, got his way of talking. With Eisenhower, there's a, a, an, an enormous amount of recordings and films of him speaking. So I, I got that that Midwestern twang. He talks like this and he was very authoritative and he said his consonants. He said everything like that. And he uh, he said college. And I told him th those kind of little Midwestern kind of things. So I use that as as Eisenhower. But I don't try to do a, a, a mimic, a, a, an absolute, you know, Rich Little or, or Frank Gorshin version of these guys. Well, when you played George Cukor in Feud, I think all of your scenes were with Jessica Lang as Joan Crawford. Did you ever meet Joan Crawford? Uh, no, but I did meet George Cukor. So I knew him and he had a he had a, a jaw that sort of stuck forward and his lower lip came up like this and this is how he talked. And so I did that a little bit. I tried not to look stupid. But I, I I did jut out my lower jaw when I did George Cukor. <laughs> well, those were just great scenes because the affection that you conveyed for the Joan Crawford character was very important because you were really the only person in that whole miniseries that gave her advice. Good advice. She trusted him because he he was a sort of a father figure to her and she trusted him. She She felt... She could be herself in his presence. Now, you know, a lot of your movies have dealt with important social issues. For example, Corey for the People dealt with domestic violence. Roots, the next generations dealt with racism. Mothers Against Drunk Driving dealt with impaired driving. Voices Within, the lives of Trudy Chase dealt with mental illness and child abuse. In Sickness and in Health dealt with homophobia and AIDS. When We Rise, which was a terrific TV miniseries dealt with the gay rights movement. How important is it to you to choose projects that convey significant key messages about social justice? Well, I feel it's not like it's important to me to choose because I don't really choose. I'm being honest with you. I get up for a part and they say, hey, maybe maybe you could play this and I audition for it or they offer it to me without an audition. And I feel very fortunate to get that job. And if it also happens to be something of political or, or philosophical or, or, you know, real worth, then I am doubly lucky to get to do it. And I feel that way about all those things that you've mentioned. Uh, the Skokie thing was, was a, a very, very emotional and, and uh, educational experience. I played a guy who, a, a Jewish lawyer for the ACLU who defended the Nazis' right to march down Skokie's main street. Skokie, which was, is a Chicago suburb, which in those days had mostly concentration camp survivors living there or their descendants. And, and he was blackballed by his family. His wife left him. He was the only character in that TV movie whose name was changed, whose character name was changed because he had suffered so much from having stood up for what he believed. 
And so, yes, I, I was I felt very honored to get to play him and all those other ones that you mentioned, too. The When We Rise, I played a guy who had a scene with his son and the real son was there telling me the father was dead already, the character I was playing. But that son's younger brother is an actor and he played his older brother with me playing their father in that very, very intense scene. So that was that was amazing too. Yeah, I, I felt very lucky to get to do those things. I think it's because you have a very unique and convincing way of conveying integrity. And it oh. doesn't surprise me that you get cast in a lot of these types of films because you have a sincerity in the way you deliver a performance, especially when there's a principled approach to the message you have to convey as an actor. Do, do you ever sit and watch your own shows? Sometimes, but not, not always. I like to just take a look and see how did it, how did it come out. But I, I've missed so many of them over the years. Now it's a little easier because you can go to a, a, you know, a Netflix or a Hulu or something and you can catch it if you missed it. But in the old days, you had to be there on Thursday night at 830 or you didn't see it. And if you missed it, then maybe in, in April or May, there would be a rerun of that episode. But you'd have to figure out when that was and be there at 830 again. So I missed, I would say, 65 to 70 percent of, of the stuff I've done. Do you think, given the hundreds of roles you've played over the years, Mr. Rubenstein, is there one role that you feel is the closest to the real John Rubenstein? <laughs> oh, my God. I No, I can't really answer that question uh, with a yes or a no. Well, do you have a favorite role that you've played? Well, there there's a play by David Rabe, who is a friend of mine, called Streamers. Came out in the 1970s. It was about three young soldiers about to be sent to Vietnam. They're, they're still home. I mean, they're in, in the army, they're in their, in their barracks, but they're, they're not abroad yet. And it's about them and the two old sergeants who come in. Charlie Durning played one of those. That was a play that that I couldn't wait to get to the theater every night and do it again. And it was always different. It was like chamber music, five characters, but a beautifully written piece. At the end, I get horribly murdered on stage and I got to bleed out all over the place. And it was technically sort of awe striking. <laughs> and I, I enjoyed, I enjoyed that. And then and then the musical Ragtime, which uh, I production of here in Los Angeles, while the, the original Broadway cast were up in Toronto before they came to Broadway. And then I took over the role on Broadway, playing Tate, the, the father, the Jewish father who comes across the ocean with his little daughter and forges a life making cut out silhouettes on the streets of New York. And then becomes comes to Hollywood and becomes a big movie director and calls himself the Baron. I loved that again. That was a that was the kind of show that I would be looking at my watch during the day saying, when when can I get to the theater and start doing that play again? You've had so many pinch me moments. You know, I mentioned Cabaret before and you not getting the role, the Joel Gray role. I know you almost got to play Michael York's role in the movie Cabaret. There must have been other roles that you missed out on. How did you learn to deal with the disappointments and the rejections in this business? Well, like everybody does in life, you know, you have your 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 future when you're a, when you're a young person and you say, "Oh boy, I hope I get to do this and I hope I get to do that." And then suddenly stuff happens. You're in a car accident or you're you're mother dies or some terrible thing happens and and that changes your life 
And so as a, in a professional way, as an actor, sure, you get your huge, oh, we've been talking about all these really fortunate moments of my life where I got to do this and I got to do that. And there were a whole bunch more where I didn't get the part and I didn't get to do this or that. Or a few where I, my agents or some miscommunication happened. Those, those are the ones that I, that I still regret today. Where I was offered a part, I wanted to do it, I couldn't wait. But then in the setting up and the agentry and the negotiation, it fell apart and I ended up not doing it. Those still stick in my throat a little bit. Yeah, I can imagine that would be very aggravating. Although, although you didn't get to work with Liza in Cabaret, you did co-star with her in a wonderful TV movie called right. Sam Found Out, a triple play. So I'm right. glad you got that chance to work together. Yeah, well, we were we were pals when we were three years old. Our parents were friends, and. She, Liza used to come over to, to our house all the time and swim in our pool and we would run around and we were we were buddies way back then. Well, you've had such an amazing career. Do you have any interest in sitting down and writing a memoir? No, not really. Uh, people ask me that a lot. I feel that I have a lot of fun stories to tell, but they aren't any more special or different uh, than pretty much every other actor who's been around a long time and has done different things as I have. You know, they're always fun, funny and fun and interesting and sometimes shocking and horrible stories to tell. And I, I do have those. But a real memoir has to deal with your life, your parents, your wife, your children, your 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 private life and that i don't i don't relish the idea of of writing a, a big story about all that stuff and 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 a memoir without that is just sort of a name dropping you know anecdotal kind of thing and i i'm, I'm not sure that that would be of interest well i beg to differ i don't think that there's many actors who have had the childhood you had who got to be raised by an absolute legend, not to mention having had the diversity of a career you've had, the stage work, the movies and the TV shows and the people you've worked with. I just feel that if they're not codified in a memoir, those stories will be gone when you're gone and they're part of show business history. You know, and I don't think your personal life is necessary. I, I've never understood why people feel, celebrities feel that they need to write a lot about their relationships, unless your relationship with somebody really famous. But, if, <laughs> you, you know, I, I mean, sure, if you were married to Liza, everybody wants to know what it was like. But otherwise, your career in and of itself is so worthy of interest. So I hope you'll reconsider. Well, I might, you know, when I'm, if if it comes to pass that I'm not working, you know, and I have that kind of time, I, I might, I might. Well, Mr. Rubenstein, it's been an enormous pleasure meeting you and having this opportunity to talk with you about your monumental career. I think you can tell I've been quite a fan for a long time and I'm yeah, honored. you know more about me than anybody I've ever run into. It's sort of amazing. <laughs> I, I'm a great admirer of your work. I'm a great admirer of your work ethic. I think that Destiny led you to projects that made a difference in the world. And mm. your presence in those projects made a difference to the audience. And it's a great joy to be able to say that we had you on our show. And I thank you for taking the time to appear on our show. Well, thank you. It's been a great pleasure to talk to you and, and very interesting too. And I, I appreciate the research that you did and, and your commitment to it. Thank you so much. Our guest has been the iconic actor, composer, director, and educator, John Rubenstein. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to my producer, Steve Silver, my director of programming, Robert Monaghan, my production assistant, Rosa Puzo, my PR directors, Eileen Shapiro and Jimmy Starr, and my entire team at the XPTV1 network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time.
Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.